Good evening, and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Myron Belkine, treasurer of the club and chair of its International Correspondence Committee, which has organized this evening's event. Tonight, you might say, is the culmination of a five-year-long campaign by our committee to fulfill a mission of enhancing the international activities and events at the National Press Club. For the first time ever, the response has been so great that we, we arrange an overflow room to accommodate everyone, and we thank all of you for coming. We are truly appreciative for you coming together for the largest ever event organized by our committee under these circumstances. The credit for this evening goes to Jan Deplain, a member of our committee who proposed that we have a marquee event on Islam pegged to the publication of the book Religion, Terror, and Error, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Challenge of Spiritual Engagement by Douglas Johnston, the president and founder of the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. As many of you know, whenever Jan has a proposal, it is difficult to say no to the idea or to her. And once again, Jan, I'm glad I listened to you. Where are you, Jan? Our thanks. Our first goal was to have an outstanding moderator of a very distinguished panel. And our first and only choice was Sally Quinn, who herself, as you know, is a very distinguished Washington Post journalist and author, who five years ago founded the On Faith blog at the Washington Post, based on the premise, in her words, that religion is the most pervasive yet least understood topic in global life. How appropriate it is, it is that our discussion tonight will focus on how religious considerations and faith-based diplomacy can contribute to the solution of conflicts around the world. And how timely it is that we are meeting exactly 24 hours after President Barack Obama delivered a major policy speech related to the U.S. role in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Thank you again for coming. I would like to call first on Douglas Johnston, who I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the past, past month as we met and planned this event. Doug on Monday said, Myron, we're going to make history at the National Press Club with this event. And I, because of the timeliness of it and the content of it, and being an objective journalist, I have to say I agree with his assessment. And again, the timeliness of it could not be better. And so, Doug, I would like to call on you to talk about the book, to uh, introduce a first time ever shown video about the Pakistan Madrasa, Madrasa Project of the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. And after he finishes, I'll then introduce the other panelists one by one, and they will say a few words. And then I will ask Sally Quinn to moderate the panel discussion tonight. Doug, over to you. Thank you, Myron, to you and your committee for welcoming us into your home. Uh, and uh, also like to thank uh, Jan, as, as others have, uh, for making this all possible. And uh, Sally and our distinguished panelists for agreeing to participate, and all of you for coming out tonight. My hope is that this uh, event can be a bit of a wake up call with respect to our country's general neglect of religion and its practice of foreign policy. And it goes beyond neglect. We don't even understand some of the basics. For example, when an American says secular, the average Muslim hears godless and what was intended was freedom to worship as you please. And the godless interpretation, one may conclude offhand that this has to do with the cultural image that we project, which uh, often is every bit as offensive to us as it is to any Muslim. But it goes much deeper than that. It goes back to the fact that the American Revolution predated the French Revolution. When our forefathers came over to this country, they left a country uh, in which absolute monarchy had made the transition to constitutional monarchy and religion had survived that process. So they leaned on it rather heavily 
when they conducted this American experiment. A few years later, 1789, with the French Revolution, it was a very different uh, scene because the church, Catholic Church especially, was seen to be complicit with the uh, monarchy and all the ills that the people were facing. And so uh, unlike in America with an Edmund Burke approach where you uh, preserve the wisdom of the ages and reform at the margins, there it was more like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. They threw the baby out with the bathwater and specifically purged religion to make way for secular humanism. So that's why you see this difference in understanding of what that word means. Uh, this was all driven home to me several years ago when we invited uh, six uh, top leaders from uh, Sudan and Kashmir, both, both areas that we were working in at the time, to the National Prayer Breakfast. And uh, five of those six were Muslims. And after the breakfast and the two days of uh, activity surrounding it, they all remarked on how absolutely surprised they were to see the degree to which religious faith underpins our democratic processes. And they said that they felt much closer as a result. So it seems supremely ironic that here we are, one of the most religious countries on the face of the planet, and yet we are so at sea uh, and unable to deal with the religious imperatives that permeate today's geopolitical landscape. And there are several reasons for this. First is the fact that we've allowed ourselves to use our separation of church and state as an excuse for not doing our homework to understand how religion informs the worldviews and political aspirations of others. Second is our long-held commitment to the rational actor model of decision-making and its exclusion of religion from the policymaker's calculus. And third is the fact that all of us seem to fall into this trap of compartmentalizing our religion to the point where we're almost embarrassed to talk about it in the workplace. Indeed, whenever industry or government hears the very word religion, they run for the hills for fear of being accused of favoring one faith tradition over another. So it was in recognition of all this that I wrote this book. And the book, in many respects, is a how-to book. It's how to incorporate religious considerations into the practice of US foreign policy. How to move beyond the rational actor model of decision making to a process that accommodates non-state actors and non-rational factors like religion. And it's also a how to book to move to a new leadership paradigm that will serve the United States better in the multipolar world that awaits us. The opportunities for going it alone are fast disappearing. And in the co course of all that, we lay out a strategy for how the U.S. can deal more effectively with the causal factors underlying religious extremism. Most of what we've done to date has been about addressing symptoms. And we do need to, we, we just need desperately to come to grips with cause. Well, here what we do is we take a hard look at existing assets that we have to see what, which of them could be usefully redirected to help deal with this problem, and then to look at whatever new capabilities might be required to bridge the remaining gap. Now, foremost among existing assets is the American Muslim community, which can play a very important role in informing our foreign policy and public diplomacy with a more nuanced understanding of Islam so that we don't end up on the wrong side of the law of unintended consequences quite so much. Um, they can also help bridge relations with other Muslim communities overseas, many of them in areas of strategic consequence, the United States. The second capability are our military chaplains who already bridge church and state and have many of the skills of dealing with different religions. But with additional training and with uh, expanded rules of engagement by forming relationships of trust with local religious leaders overseas, uh, they will become much better equipped to understand what's going on and how to advise their commanders on what the cultural or religious implications are of decisions that are about to be taken. And finally, it's, there's the NGO community, of which we are a part, non-governmental organizations. They, NGOs enjoy a flexible, apolitical uh, posture that's 
can be very, very helpful, particularly in dealing with the transnational aspects of the uh, threats that we face. Amongst new capabilities that are required, first is realigning the executive branch. And here we offer four different organizational structures for the State Department that would enable them to be dealing with religion in the natural course of doing business every day. Uh, fundamental to all of those structures is the establishment of a new position called religion attache. Now, uh, this would be someone who has been uh, trained probably with a theological background and others, but who understand the nuances and who can deal with the complexities of many of these religious issues that most other folks can't deal with. And the naysayers will tell you uh, by establishing such a position, that's the quickest way to marginalize it and the function that it represents. And I disagree with that strongly. I believe if you were to place these people in the political section of our embassies, and you gave them comparable status and responsibilities as we do our political military officers, these political religious officers could start having an impact and an influence on our decisions quite quickly. Uh, second would be the fact that uh, uh, we need to address the political ambiguities surrounding the separation of church and state. And there's a whole chapter devoted to that. There's a whole chapter devoted to each one of these things that I'm talking about. But there, the answer is quite simple, straightforward. The President of the United States just needs to turn to the Justice Department and says, make the legal case for us to use religious engagement as a component of our foreign policy. And then it would be very helpful to get uh, endorsement of both uh, houses of Congress. Uh, but that's readily done. And if we did that, that would enable our political leaders and military leaders who feel intimidated by these political ambiguities from taking the kinds of actions needed to deal with the religious dimensions of the threats that they're facing. Uh, thirdly, we need an effective conflict prevention capability. And here the book suggests that uh, the formation of conflict prevention uh, research teams that would go into areas, trouble spots, before things have heated up, uh, assess very carefully what needs to be done, come back with policy prescriptions, and help us to enable us to nip these things in the bud before they turn into conflict. Well, the ounce of prevention is worth many pounds uh, of gain. So uh, finally, it, we need to support what we call a process of organic suasion, which suggests uh, change and healing from within. And implicit in this is the fact that one would have to believe that as in Islamic, within Islamic uh, traditions and sacred texts that one can find the wherewithal to counter illegitimate warfare being conducted in its name. Well, And probably one of the better examples of this business of organic suasion is a project that we've been doing that you heard mentioned made earlier, and that's uh, reforming the madrasas in Pakistan, including those that gave birth to the Taliban. Now, for seven years, we've been on the ground there trying to uh, deal with these uh, madrasa leaders and uh, to turn things around. Few of us in the West, however, understand the illustrious history of these schools. If you read the media, uh, all you get is that these are seedbeds of terrorism. Well, once upon a time, in the Middle Ages through the 16th century, they were without peer as institutions of higher learning in the world at the time. It was only European exposure to them that gave birth to our own university system. And you would be stunned at how many of the traditions and mores of academe trace their roots back to the madrasas starting with the mortarboards and tassels you wear at graduation. Uh, so they've enjoyed this great history and this time in the sun, but then under the impact of British colonialism, they, sought, they feared for the loss of their Muslim identity. So they sought to purge themselves of all subjects that were either secular or Western in nature, to the point where the majority of them today are about rote memorization of the Quran and the study of Islamic principles. Now, our goals have been, been, there have been twofold. First is to expand the curriculums to include the physical and social sciences uh, with a heavy emphasis on human rights, particularly women's rights, and religious tolerance. We don't pretend to touch the religious core. It would be far too sensitive. But our assumption is if we do a good job in both of these areas, 
this can smooth a lot of the rough edges. And all of the evidence that we've seen suggests that that's a valid assumption. Second, probably more important goal, is to transform the pedagogy to create critical thinking skills amongst the students. When we first began, if a student so much as raised its hand in class, he was punished for disrespect. And why this is so important is you'll find these youngsters, as young as the age of 12, who've memorized the Quran from cover to cover, and they're essentially clueless as to what it means because they've had to memorize it in Arabic, and their first language is Urdu. Uh, but along comes the local militant, who misappropriates a little scripture, as all religions are guilty of doing from time to time, to recruit these kids to their cause, and these children have absolutely no ability to question or to challenge. They just go do as they're asked. Uh, so this is why it's so very important. Uh, thus far, at this point, after seven years, we've engaged uh, a little over 2,700 madrasa leaders from about 1,633 madrasas. Uh, that is, you know, some would look at that and say, well, that's pretty impressive. Uh, it's it is, but it isn't. There's about 20,000 of these madrasas. But most of the ones we've dealt with have been in the radical areas, so we really feel we have sufficient momentum to take this to scale across the country. And securing the resources to do that is a major challenge at this point. Um, one can legitimately ask, why have we succeeded where... Uh, all others have failed. And there's about four reasons for this. First is ownership. We've done this in such a way that the madrasa leaders feel it's their reform project and not something imposed from the outside, which means that they have a lot of say in the change process. These are bright people, contrary to the stereotypes you'll read in the media. And I just want to take a moment to read for you the initial paragraph in our teacher awareness module, which was crafted by a madrasa leader. I quote, I have come to a frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. My personal approach creates the climate. My daily mood makes the weather. Makes the weather. As a teacher, I have a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it's my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. Pretty powerful stuff. Second uh, ingredient in the success is uh, appealing to their own heritage, not only the heritage of their schools, which as I said before is illustrious, but going back in time a thousand years ago when many of the pioneering breakthroughs in the arts and sciences took place under Islam, including religious tolerance at a time when Christianity was woefully intolerant. The more they hear this and internalize it, the taller they walk and the more they think, hey, maybe we can do better. Thirdly, and I think most important of all, is uh, we ground all suggested change in Islamic principles so that they can genuinely feel they're becoming better Muslims in the process, and they are. And the fourth ingredient is a posture of humility driven by two things. First is uh, our understanding of the fact that it was the United States that was principally responsible for planting the seeds of jihad in the madrasas in the first place. We were trying to grow holy warriors to evict the godless Soviets out of Afghanistan. When that was done, we left. Many of you have seen Charlie Wilson's war. That's pretty accurate. And now we're back, and they're doing what we trained them to do. They just changed targets. So this is, uh, again, the law of unintended consequences. But the other aspect of the humility is uh, if you think about uh, Proverbs uh, 18, verse 13, which says, only a fool judges a matter before he hears it. And what we try to do is you know, not just hear what they have to say, but make the effort to try to hear through their ears what we're saying, to think about that in advance. And that really serves us well. I would say, uh, in summarizing here, that uh, this work that's with the madrasas, as far as I'm concerned, there is nothing going on either on or off the battlefield that's any more strategic than this. This is the asymmetric counter to the asymmetric threat. It gets at the ideas behind the guns. And one short anecdote to illustrate how that happens. 
A little over a year ago, we were conducting a workshop for 16 madrasas surrounding the Swat Valley. And uh, towards the end of that workshop, one of the madrasa leaders stood up and turned out he was the commander in Lashkari Taiba, who are the folks that brought you the attacks on Mumbai. He says, I came here for one reason and one reason only. I came here to discredit everything you have to say. He says, but now I find myself standing here full of rage. Rage because for 26 years I've been teaching the Quran, studying it and teaching it the same way it was taught to me. He says, for the first time in my life, I feel like I've experienced the soul of the Holy Quran and its peaceful intent. He says, I now see that the right way to advance Islam is through peace, not through conflict. He said, I'm going to change what I tell my students, and I'm going to tell them why. And we came back a month later. Ozzy Hussein came back as our project director. And uh, sure enough, the, this leader was doing exactly as he promised. They also happened to have a CNN team along. They'd been after us for three years to document some of our work. And he says it to CNN, for God and the whole world to hear. And it just bowled me over because you look cross-eyed in the Swat Valley uh, when the Taliban was in charge and you'd lose your head. And here's a guy, I, mean, I guess he got cut some slack because he was a terrorist commander, but he's still alive. But it's uh, amazing because we find that in working with these madrasa leaders, once you penetrate, uh, work your way past that veneer of rage and hostility, uh, not, not only do they get it, they, once they engage, they not only get it, but <clears throat> a lot of them become champions of it at great personal risk to themselves. In conclusion, I would just like to read a couple of paragraphs from the conclusion of the book. You know, the whole book is about change, and change is never easy, as we are reminded by Niccolo Machiavelli some five centuries ago. I quote, It ought to be remembered that there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions, and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. This coolness arises partly from fear of the opponents who have the laws on their side, and partly from the incredulity of men who do not readily believe in new things until they have had a long experience of them. Confirming the above and indicative of the inertia to be overcome is the following observation by a conservative commentator in response to recent attempts by the United States to reach out to regimes that were previously deemed off limits. I quote, the world is in fact a dangerous place inhabited by fundamentalist regimes, crusading radicals and amoral power seekers. Realism would dictate that we be pessimists and cynics, never trusting until verified basing our foreign policy on the past actions of our opponents and not on their sweet words or our even sweeter hopes. Well, history suggests the need to heed such advice and above all to proceed with our eyes open. It does not, however, negate the fact that the world is changing and that we need to anticipate that change by making the necessary adjustments to our prospective role and leadership style. For a new paradigm to be accepted, it needs only to be provably better than its predecessor. There is no requirement that it explain all of the facts or situations with which it is confronted, only that it does a better job of predicting and responding to, to them than any of its competitors. Crisis often proliferates new discovery, and it's typically the failure of existing rules, think rational actor, that leads to a search for new ones. Because the stakes are so extraordinarily high in today's interconnected world, we can neither afford the crisis or the failure of rules as a prerequisite to making the necessary change. The time has come. The future is now. Thank you very much. <laughs>